seated. Once again, a very warm word of welcome to the preacher tonight, the Reverend Stuart, and we're going to ask him to come now and bring the word of God. Thank you, brother. We do appreciate the words of welcome, and we also appreciate such good singing. All the altos must be out tonight. Um, maybe the sopranos have been left at home. They're the children, but all the altos are here anyway. I could hear you singing, and plenty of bass as well. I don't know where the tenors were, but we do appreciate hearty singing, and it is uh, good to be with you again tonight. We trust that God will bless us around his word. If you have a copy of God's word, take it and turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, for Bible reading this evening. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and we'll read from the opening verse. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and we'll read from verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. We'll end our reading there at the end of verse 7. And before we uh, bring the word, let's just engage in prayer, please, for a few moments' time. Let's pray. O God, our Father, we do thank Thee for the song that we have been singing off. We thank Thee for the friend of sinners. We thank Thee for the Savior. We thank Thee for the one who is our guide. O God, we bless Thee for our Redeemer, the one who came from heaven and came into this world. We thank Thee. O oh God, for the one who calls sinners home, we thank thee for the ministry of, of Aaron and Joshua and Jonathan tonight. And we pray, O oh God, that even their praise may have, O oh God, touched hearts already in this house. We pray, O oh God, that there might be a deepening sense of thy presence even in this place tonight. Grant thy servant to be clothed with wisdom and power. Grant, O oh God, us an anointing the anointing of heaven, the unction of God, the Holy Spirit. O oh God, help us to minister to this congregation of people. We pray at the end, by, the, by the end of this meeting that sinners would find themselves repenting and trusting in Christ alone. So answer prayer. Shut us in with God. O oh God, put out our unbelief, we pray, and the wicked foe we ask of thee. And we pray, O oh God, for a good boundary of Christ's blood be about this meeting place tonight. We pray this in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Rather than being complimentary, the words just quoted were intended to be a derisory insult against the Savior of men by those who wish to cast a slur upon the character and the ministry of the eternal Son of God. You see, the Pharisees and scribes, by leveling such an accusation against the Lord Jesus Christ, namely his happy reception of sinners, were calling into question the claims that the Savior had been making about himself. Because surely, if he was who he claimed to be, the Holy Son of God, he would not be associating himself with such unholy people such as these publicans and sinners. These self-righteous individuals could not understand how such a setter forth of divine truth could have any kind of association with such religiously ignorant and socially wicked people. And therefore they ironically, uh, ironically taunted him by saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Yet the very words that were meant to be a reproach 
upon the Son of God were adopted as the true description of the work that Jesus Christ came to do on this earth. The receiving of sinners on to himself was the very reason why he had come from the Father. To verify that truth of his reception of sinners, the Savior then unfolds from the verse 4 onwards a threefold parable. Each parable reaffirming and reinforcing the wondrous truth that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, really does receive sinful men. Before we leave this meeting place tonight, I want to preach a message from this statement that we have here in Luke chapter 15 and the verse number 2. In a message that I have entitled, This Man Receiveth Sinners. In the first place tonight, I want to preach about this man. And what a grand and what a glorious and what a worthwhile and what an inexhaustible subject matter that is for any preacher to preach upon the man Christ Jesus. And then I want in the second place to pass some comment upon the grouping of people that we have within our text. Sinners. This man receiveth sinners. And then in conclusion, I want to consider what this man does for and with such sinners. Consider then firstly with me, this man, this man. The words this man obviously refer us to the one to whom the publicans and sinners had drew near to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. But by referring to him as this man, these Pharisees and scribes were placing a question mark over the deity of Jesus Christ. They did not say here, the Son of Man receiveth sinners. Because to these men, Jesus Christ was simply a man. A man who claimed to be the eternal Son of God. A claim that they refused to accept. However, Jesus Christ, though God, was also a man. But he was a man like, unlike every other man that had ever been born before him. And certainly unlike every other man that has been born after him. I want you to note some things about this man. The man that we present in the gospel. I notice first of all that he is true man. He is true man. When the eternal son of God was born in Bethlehem. He took into union with his divine nature a true human nature. John 1 reminds us that the word, speaking of the eternal word, the Lord Jesus Christ, the word became flesh. Redemption's plan required it to be so. In order for sinful men to be reconciled to holy God, they needed a mediator, a mediator that was related to both God and man, and such a man was found in this man, the man Christ Jesus. At his birth, the Son of God did not give up any of his deity, but rather he became man, yet never ceased to be God. It's a miracle. In his full humanity, the Lord Jesus Christ lived for us. And by living for us, he met every precept of the law. He fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf. Every commandment, every precept ordered by God was kept by him perfectly. And then in his flesh, he died for us, whereby he met the penalty of that broken law, the law that Adam broke. First Peter 3, verse 18 reminds us, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The eternal Son became a man in order that he might die that he might die for our sins and pay the price of sin. And at the commencement of this gospel meeting tonight, I want to challenge every unconverted person in this place. I wonder, sinner, are you aware to, to the lens, the lens to which the Son of God went in order to rescue a sinner like you, that he would leave aside the throne of heaven, that he would leave aside the glory of of that celestial place, that he would leave aside the praise and the adoration of the holy angels. He would clad himself in human flesh. When God became a man, born of a virgin in Bethlehem's manger, that he would endure all the miseries of this life, and then he would offer up himself to the agony and to the shame and to the disgrace and to the curse of the cross 
What a man this man is. He was truly man. Truly man. But this man was also perfect man. Perfect man. It is his perfection as a man that sets Jesus Christ apart and distinct from every other individual human being that has ever lived. Only one man can ever claim to never have sinned, the man Christ Jesus. He did not sin. He could not sin. And the fact that Jesus Christ was a perfect man is affirmed by testimony throughout the Word of God. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate said concerning this man in Luke 23, verses 4 and 14, I find no fault in this man. He would later say, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. The repentant dying thief said about this man, This man hath done nothing amiss. The Roman centurion at the foot of the cross said, Certainly this was a righteous man. And here we have testimony coming together to affirm the truth that Jesus Christ is perfect man. Because to have sinned would have rendered his work for us on the cross unacceptable before a holy God. Because it's only a sinless Savior that can save sinful men and women. And such is this man, the man Christ Jesus. But this man is not only perfect man, he's not only true man, but he is divine man. Divine man. Jesus Christ is both God and man. The Roman centurion, again at the foot of the cross, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. He got the tense wrong. He got it wrong because he is the Son of God. He just viewed him as the dying and the dead Savior on the cross. And he viewed him as a dead God. But rather, we can say, this man is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is not part God, part man. He's not, as it were, a hybrid of deity and humanity. He's not one-third God. Rather, he's fully God and he's fully man. Speaking of Christ, Paul said in Colossians 2 and the verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And such makes him sinner, such makes him adequately suitable and uniquely fitted to be the sinner's savior. Because being God, he can fully meet God's requirements and effect a peace between God and man. And being perfect man, he can represent man and reconcile himself, in himself, sinful man to holy God. And see, a friend, it is this man that you need tonight. It's not the minister of this congregation that you need. It's not this evangelist that you need. It's not any other member of the clergy that you need. No other man do I point you tonight but to this man, this divine man, this true man, this perfect man, this man who offered himself as a sacrifice for sins forever and is now seated at the Father's right hand. And so, sinner, turn your eyes away from every other man and turn your eyes on to this man, the man Christ Jesus, because it's him you need, Christ alone. It is this true, perfect Divine man that receives sinners. This man receiveth sinners. This man who was born in poverty. This man who, lay, who lived in obscurity. This man who died in agony is the man who receives sinners unto himself. This man who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners is the man that welcomes sinners. This man who is the heir of all things the expressed image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person. It is this man that freely receives sinful men. Now think of that. Because whenever we consider the perfection, 
the holiness and the sinfulness of this man, it is surely then an act of mercy and infinite grace on the part of God himself to admit sinners into his company. Has to be. This holy one, this perfect one, this divine one, that he would welcome such sinners into his company, that's an act of infinite mercy and grace on the part of Jesus Christ. You see, sinner, don't you get into your mind to think that if you became a Christian that you're going to add something to God. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. God is perfectly happy within himself. Well, we read of that over in the book of Job whenever the mountains, before they were ever created, we find there the Trinity. And we find in that passage, Job chapter 8, that his delight was with the sons of men, but his delight was also in his servant, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in happy, blissful communion before any of us were ever made fully satisfied in himself. And so don't think that you're going to do God a favor tonight by becoming a Christian. It is an act of God's mercy that he would save you. And think of it as that way. There's nothing deserving within you. Nothing whatsoever to, as it were, bring you any merit before God. It is only of his mercy and his grace that he allows sinners to come into his family see it by his grace. You know, he allows us, he admits us into his company, he receives sinners. But something has to happen before we're accepted, before we're admitted into his company. The nature, the sin nature must change. Ah, the sins of our past must be put away. Our old nature, it must be replaced by a new nature. It's called the divine Nature, a nature that's marked by holiness and righteousness and truth. And so I, can I say to you, if you're an unsaved person in this house tonight, if you're listening via the world wide web, can I say that if you're ever to be in the company of this man, then you need a supernatural change of heart. You need a miracle of God's grace. You need God to come and intervene and step into your life and into your circumstances, and into your heart. And you need that sin of yours to be put away, purged, cleansed, in order that you might be admitted into his company. Because all that is offensive to God must be put away by the blood of his dear Son. And all that takes place when a sinner comes to Christ in repentance and exercises faith it is my prayer that tonight you'll walk the road of repentance because it is a road that will lead you to this man the man Christ Jesus having considered this man by drawing your attention to the son of God I want to consider in the second place uh, the grouping of people spoken of in our text namely sinners sinners this man receiveth sinners the Greek word used here for sinners simply means those who are devoted to sin. Those who have given themselves over to sin. It is such people that this man receives. And again in this we see a wonder, the wonder of God's grace. It's only by God's grace that God would receive those who are devoted to their sin, who have submerged themselves and crimes of deepest dye who have stained their lives with sins of crimson hue who have entangled themselves with the vices of unimaginable wickedness. I tell you, it's a wonder of God's grace that God would receive such individuals. Sinners. Sinners. Notice that the Savior doesn't receive all men. But sinners. That's humbling. You see, that, that word sinners, that reminds us that he only receives those who acknowledge themselves to be such, to be sinners. And therefore, the self-righteous 
He rejects the proud. He overlooks the indifferent. He passes by. But sinners, sinners of all kinds, sinners of all types, he gladly, freely, and spontaneously receives. Sinners. Octavius Winslow, a 19th century preacher, said, yes, he receives sinners. He receives them as sinners, he said, lost, undone, self-destroying sinners, sinners too vile, too helpless to save themselves, who, if he does not save them, never can be saved. He receives sinners of all conditions and of every hue, of every depth of guilt and character of crime. This man receiveth such sinners. Those whom he receives are often burdened, bowed down, disconsolate, poor, friendless, hopeless, helpless, ignorant, weary sinners. Those whom he welcomes are often undeserving, unworthy, unloving, unhappy, ungodly, unjust sinners. We've all inherited sin, and therefore we're all sinners. Romans 3, 23, all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so tonight, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Tonight, you're out of Christ. You're a sinner outside of God's grace. But this mission has been convened in order that it might present to you the grace of God, that you might come to Christ, repent of sin, believe the gospel, and be saved, and be made a sinner saved by grace. Now the question arises... What kind of sinners does Jesus receive? Well, can I say in the first place that he receives great sinners. Great sinners. Publicans and sinners were the people who came to hear him. Then drew near unto him, verse 1, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. You know, in the eyes of these Religious men, the Pharisees and scribes, publicans and sinners were great sinners. And yet it was to such people that Christ received and still receives. Maybe tonight in this place you feel yourself to be a great sinner. But let me remind you that no matter what your sin may be, no matter how small you think your sin is, it is because it is a great sin because of the one that you sin against. Because one sin against an infinite God is an infinite sin. Your sin may be great, but God's grace is greater. It is. Archibald Alexander, he said, though your sins are very great, The kind Redeemer, speaking of Christ, will not cast you out. Even if that were true, which you sometimes think that you are the greatest sinner who ever lived upon the earth, he will not cast you out, he said. His blood cleanses from all sin. It is as easy, he said, for Christ to save a great sinner as a small sinner. No one has ever been saved because his sins were small and no one was ever rejected on account of the greatness of his sins. You know, maybe tonight you're here and you're in despair. You're in despair over the greatness of your sin. Well then, listen to the words. In Romans 5 and the verse 20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Thank God the superabounding grace of God can deal with the greatness of your sin tonight because this man receives great sinners. But in the second place, he receives convinced sinners. Let me explain what I mean. The Bible makes it clear that every one of us born of Adam are born in sin. However, all men and all women are not convinced of that revealed truth and stark reality. Some people, they wrongly conceive themselves or convince themselves by their moral living and by their religious activities that they are inherently good. God cannot receive such people. He said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's what the great physician of the soul said. 
Not those who, who think themselves to be good and moral and upright. But he said those that know themselves to be sinners. Those are the ones that I came to save. Those that are convinced that they are deserving of hell. That they are deserving of God's justice being poured out upon them eternally for the crimes and the offenses and the transgressions that they have done against God. I tell you, it is individuals who feel themselves convinced that they are lost and they are done done. It is those individuals that Christ came to see you, convinced sinners. And so the question is, are you a convinced sinner? Ah, oh, preacher, I'm a good neighbor. I go to my church. I say my prayers. I read my Bible. I'm charitable. I'm kind. I'm a devoted mother. I'm a loyal husband. Ah, my dear friend, none of those things carry merit with God. Ah, the thing that you need to realize is that you're guilty, that you're condemned, and you need the Savior. And if you're convinced of that very truth, Thank God Christ will receive you now in this meeting. But if you in your pride would say, I don't need the Savior, I'm not a sinner, well, he'll not receive you because he receives sinners. That's what the text says, sinners. And only sinners. Until you're sensible of your danger, you'll never fly to Christ. Until you sense your need, you'll never resort to the foot of the cross. Until you're convinced that you're a sinner, Christ will never receive you. And so it is my prayer that the Spirit of God, whose office it is and work it is to convince men of their sin, their need of righteousness and of coming judgment, it is my prayer that the Spirit of God, where you sit at this present moment of time, would convince you, I am a sinner, I need a Savior, and thank God this man will receive me, the man Christ Jesus. Thirdly, he receives repenting sinners. You know, folks, a man or woman may be convinced that they are a sinner and a great one at that. But if they don't turn to God in repentance, he cannot receive them. But the prodigal within this chapter, Luke 15, sinners must arise out of their sin and get to Christ. Such is repentance and arising out of sin and getting to Christ. That's what you need to do tonight. Arise out of your sin. Get to Christ. If you hear nothing else in this meeting, listen to those words. I must arise out of my sin and go to Christ. That's the way of salvation. That's the way home. That's the way to heaven. That's the way to be with Christ eternally. That's the way to see that godly mother who's already gone to be with Christ. That's the way to meet your father who's already passed through the veil of death and entered and taken up, as it were, residency with the society of the glorified saints. That's the way I must arise out of my sin and get to Christ must repent. And so if you're willing to leave your sin tonight, and trust in Christ, then thank God Christ will receive you. He will. But fourthly, he receives believing sinners. Those sinners who believe that in Christ alone their hope of heaven is to be found, those who trust him alone for salvation are those that he willingly willingly receives but as many as receive him to them give he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name believing sinners he makes sons and daughters of God great sinners convinced sinners repenting sinners believing sinners these are the sinners that this man receives and so let me address you. You tonight who are at wit's end corner, you who have found no relief in sin's pleasures, you whose mind is guilt-ridden and whose life is stained by sin, hear the glad tidings of the gospel. This man receiveth sinners. Our final consideration 
We've thought about this man. We've thought about ourselves, sinners. What does this man do for and with sinners? I want you to notice that our text does not say that this man rejects sinners. Our text does not say that this man condemns sinners. It does not say that this man passes by and ignores sinners. It does not say that this man has no time for sinners. Rather, our text says that this man receives sinners. That word receiveth, very interesting word. It means in the original to wait, to watch, to look out for, to lie and wait, to admit. And whenever we think of that, it carries the very thought that Jesus Christ, think of it, is looking out for sinners. And if you understand that word receiveth, then you understand all three parts of the one parable that's given in Luke 15. Looking out for, waiting for, watching for. What did the shepherd do? He went out looking for the sheep. What did the woman who lost the silver coin do? She went searching and looking for the lost coin. What did the father do? Well, if you read the passage and if you read the account that is told, it seems to suggest that the father was wanting, watching and waiting and looking for the return of his wayward boy because he saw him a great way off because he was receiving sinners. Andrew Bonner said, Christ lies in wait for sinners. Not merely waits in his house to receive them, but he watches for them, looks out for them, goes out in a quest for them. In his work of saving, Christ is aggressive. He goes out in order to find them. He is ever on the lookout. He does not merely sit above upon his throne, willing to receive applicants of those who come, but he comes down among us. He goes to and fro on the earth. He walks up and down in it. His daily, hourly work is going in a quest for sinners. And thank God this gospel mission is a vehicle whereby the blessed Son of God is going on a quest for sinners. And providence has brought you to this house tonight. Maybe you're not comfortable in an atmosphere like this. I understand that. I wouldn't feel comfortable in Kelly's nightclub. I understand where you are, sinner. This is maybe all new to you. But God, in the person of his Son, is on a quest for your soul. He's looking out for you. He's watching for you. He's seeing, is there any movement towards you? And the question that comes to my mind is, will he find you in this meeting? Will he? Will he find you? He's waiting. He's watching. He's ready to meet, meet you and your first movings towards him. And so why not step out for Christ? Step out on the promise. Get under the blood. Let not Satan whisper in your ear and say, he'll never receive you. He will. He will. You have his word on it. We've seen it. This man receiveth sinners. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. This is the word of a perfect gentleman. You can stake your eternal soul on that very word tonight. He will receive you wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever sins you've been involved in. Thank God this man will receive you. Sinners Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all. And where will he receive you to? He'll receive you into his grace. And he'll receive you into his family. And he'll receive you into his church. And he'll see, receive you into his love. And thank God when death comes, 
He'll receive you into glory. That's where he'll receive you. Sinner, tonight you will find this man, the God-man, to be the most welcoming of individuals. All that come to him, he gladly and willingly receives. What a welcome awaits you from this man. Charlotte Elliot was visiting some friends in the West End of London where she met the eminent minister, Caesar Mallon, while seated at the supper table. The minister said he hoped that she was a Christian. Charlotte took great offense at that and replied that she would rather not discuss that question. Dr. Mallon said that he was sorry if he had offended her, but that he always liked to speak a word for his master, and he hoped that someday the young lady would become a worker for Jesus Christ. A number of weeks passed, and they met again in the home of a common friend. Miss Elliot told the minister that ever since he had spoken to her about the matter of her soul's salvation, she had been trying to find the Savior, but all to no avail. And now she had come to ask him how she could come to the Savior. Just come to him as you are, Dr. Mallon said. She did. She came to the Savior just as she was. Shortly after that, she wrote probably one of the best-known hymns within her own hymn book, Just As I Am. Thinking of her reception by Christ, Charlotte wrote these words in the fifth stanzas of that hymn. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because I promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. Sinner, tonight the Savior will receive welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve you if you, like Charlotte Elliot, will come just as you are, as a sinner. The word receiveth, it carries the thought of friendship. The words eateth with them carries the thought of fellowship. You cannot have fellowship until there is friendship. And until you're a child of God and the enmity that exists between you and God, then you'll never have fellowship with God. The eat of with them, it speaks of a table. It speaks of that place of fellowship, the table. Though written to the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3 verse 20 can be applied in the gospel. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him and will sup with him and he with me. There's fellowship. There's friendship. There were many people in Israel in the time when Christ walked this earth whom he did not receive. Now it is true that he'd never cast any who came to him. But the sad thing was that many never even tried or attempted to come to him. So how could he ever have received them? He has pledged to save sinners now. But the time is short. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And soon God's day of grace will end. And he will receive sinners no more. But he will drive them from his presence with the words, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Tonight, he will receive you. He will. You're a sinner. This man will receive you. Will you come because when you come to him and you receive him 
he will in turn receive you. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. May you come to Christ. Let's bow in prayer, please. Both myself and Reverend Park will be at the door to shake your hand. Maybe the Lord's been troubling you. You feel yourself to be a great sinner, a great sinner. But tonight you're willing to become a repenting and a believing sinner. Well, thank God Christ can receive you. He will, he will. He's promised it. And so if we can help you, if we can assist you in any manner, just say going out the door, I need to speak. I need to speak with you. I need to be saved. I'm a sinner. And we'll be delighted to take the word of God and show you how you can be saved. It's as simple as a turning from sin, a trusting in Christ, an abandoning of that old sinful lifestyle and a living a new life that's created in righteousness and holiness. May God save you. Our loving Father, we thank thee that this verse, we have been enclosed ourselves into its embrace. We have proved it to be so in our lives. I have proved it to be so the moment I came he received me. And we thank thee for that. O oh God, we pray that tonight sinners will arise out of their sin and get to Christ and find in him the most wonderful welcome that they've ever known. Answer prayer. May the Spirit apply the truth of thy word to the hearts of all who have heard. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.